Did animals cause suffering, kill, and eat other animals before the fall of Adam and Eve? In the video on Genesis 129 30 and Genesis 9 3, we saw that animal predation and suffering were more than likely absent in the pre fall world. We also saw that all land breathing animals were created as herbivores. If you haven't seen that video, then please go back and check it out. You'll find the link in the description. In this video, I want to reinforce that interpretation by looking at passages from Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65. In Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, Isaiah says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In context, Isaiah is describing the time of Messiah's reign when righteousness, justice, and equity will be restored to the earth. The parallel passage in Isaiah 65 leaves no question as to the timing of this restoration. It is yet future when God establishes the new heavens and new earth. Up until recently, most commentators connected the benevolent change in animal behavior found in both of these passages to a time before the fall of Adam when animal hostility and predation were absent. Using the early chapters of Genesis as a backdrop, these commentators would then interpret Isaiah 11 and 65 in one of two ways, either literally and thus describing a restored creation where the curse of Adam is removed and where animals once again return to herbivorous lifestyles, or symbolically where the animal behavior describes a change in human disposition, where hatred, cruelty, and human bloodthirstiness no longer reign. John Calvin, for example, favored a more symbolic interpretation, although he never rejected a literal reading either. But more importantly, Calvin fully accepted Isaiah's dependence on the early chapters of Genesis. Speaking about the lion, Calvin says, Straw will be the food of the lion as well as the ox, for if the stain of sin had not polluted the world, no animal would have been addicted to prey on blood, but the fruits of the earth would have sufficed for all according to the method which God had appointed. Then he quotes Genesis 1.30. The use of either a literal or symbolic interpretation is still common today, but most commentators no longer make the connection with the early chapters of Genesis and a pre-fall world that excluded animal hostility and predation. Consider this quote from the theistic evolutionary website Biologos. Other passages speak of the wolf laying down with the lamb instead of killing the lamb, but these verses refer to the future kingdom of God, not the original creation. This writer is obviously opting for a literal future interpretation of the new heavens and new earth where animals will turn to herbivory but rejects any association with the early chapters of Genesis. A more recent analysis by Joshua Van E interprets the herbivorous nature of predatory animals to mean that God will no longer curse Israel with wild and dangerous animals. In other words, the lion eating straw like the ox is just an exaggerated way to say that lions will no longer attack and endanger Israelites. This treatment is obviously more symbolic, but as with the previous author, Van E. removes the creation account as a backdrop to Isaiah's prophecy. Van E. says, there are no creational texts in the Hebrew Bible or the ancient Near East similar enough in their descriptions to form the background for an allusion in Isaiah 11, 6 through 8. So why would modern commentators want to disassociate 
Isaiah 11 and 65 from the creation account? Well, personally, I think the answer is quite obvious. If Isaiah attributes the future change in animal behavior to the removal of the curse, which is outlined in the early chapters of Genesis, then that means that the hostile and predatory nature of wolves, leopards, and lions, as it exists in the present, is not a normal part of the natural world. There was a time before the present when these kinds of predatory animals were herbivorous. Of course, all old earth advocates, they can't accept this doctrinal position because according to all, old earth positions, some animals were created to kill and eat. So let's now turn to the scriptures to demonstrate that contrary to these more modern assessments, Isaiah did in fact use the creational backdrop from the early chapters of Genesis to inspire his prophetic vision of the new heavens and the new earth. Let's first look at the first three groups of animals used in both Isaiah 11 and 65. Notice that Isaiah includes predatory beasts, domestic animals, and snakes. These same three groups of animals are mentioned in Genesis 3.14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. Other groups like birds and fish were likely also included in the curse, but for whatever reason, these three wild animals, livestock and snakes, were specifically mentioned by God. That Isaiah is reaching back to this verse is clear from Isaiah 65.25, where he says, And dust shall be the serpent's food. In Genesis 3.14, God cursed the symbol of Satan's deception, the snake, physiologically altering its mode of locomotion and, as a consequence, that which enters its mouth. God said, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. This very tight connection with Genesis 3.14 is important because it grounds the present hostility of predatory animals and snakes to the historic fall and curse as recorded in the early chapters of Genesis. Given this clear contextual link, it becomes quite obvious why Isaiah believed that lions will one day eat straw like an ox. Isaiah is simply taking Genesis 129.30 in conjunction with Genesis 9.3 at face value. All animals were vegetarian before the fall. The cessation of hostilities between man and beast, as described by Isaiah, also connects well with Genesis 9.2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens, and upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. In the new heavens and new earth, this divinely imposed hostility will be reversed when the little child shall lead the wolf, the leopard, and the lion in the same way he leads domesticated animals. And of course, this new covenant with the animal realm is spoken of in Hosea 2.18 and more generally in Romans 8.21. In summary then, Isaiah 11 and 65 in conjunction with Genesis 1.29.30 Genesis 3.14 and Genesis 9.2 and 3 clearly, clearly teach us that before the fall of Adam and Eve, all animals were in fact herbivores and that God's curse on creation somehow altered the biological makeup of animals in some rather dramatic ways. But that one day in the new eschatological reign of Christ, many aspects of this curse will be reversed. Isaiah 11 and 65 are meant to draw the reader into this new world where God's knowledge will somehow cause predatory animals to become herbivores and where the hostility between man and beasts and snakes will be vanquished. All of nature, it would seem, is going to change in some rather dramatic ways. Look, I get it. Because of our experience with the present fallen world, it's kind of difficult to get our head around this concept. But look, 
God can do whatever he wants. If he says he's going to cause predatory animals to become herbivores, then they are going to become herbivores. And if he can cause that kind of change to occur in the future, then why can he not have ordained it to be that way in the past? Okay, so that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. For more resources, please go to my website, www.creationunfolding.com. I've got a book, of course, if you are interested. Please go ahead and hit that like button if you are in any way blessed by this video. And look, if you thought that this video might be useful for your friends, then please go ahead and share it on your social media platforms as well. And of course, if you want easier access to more videos as they pop up and are published, then please go ahead and subscribe and ring the bell as well. And always I ask this, and so I'm asking it again, please take a moment now and pray for me. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.